uh, more than just lyrics in the song, but that those words accurately depict the state of your soul, that it is what that part of you designed for relationship with God. I pray that is the case for you. We're majoring in Acts for the next several weeks. We come to chapter 3 this morning. I will each week take a chapter. I'm finding it a rather daunting task to focus in on precisely when there's so much there. And so in order to ensure that the Holy Spirit has the opportunity for you to learn from the entirety of the chapter, we'll listen to the text each week and then I'll do my best to draw your attention to some things that he's drawn my attention to. But first, listen carefully, especially for the, man, he drops a lot of names in this chapter. Listen to those and then we'll go on. Chapter three. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him, as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. But when Peter saw this, he replied to the people, Men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you gaze at us as if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, the one whom you delivered and disowned in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man, whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as you rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent and return, so that your sins may be wiped away, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ, appointed for you, whom heaven must receive, until the period of restoration of all things, about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Moses said, the Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days. It is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. For you first God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your wicked ways. First of 
first a word of thanks. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful gift. During the loss of my brother Colton, love Seth, Deborah, Tyson, Peyton, and Amelia Edwards, family just across the road. Uh, Deborah's brother Colton, big brother, lost uh, recently. Uh, just to thank you, and your giving makes it possible for us to love on them um, on your behalf. Uh, speaking of loving on someone in your behalf, shoo, that's lots of stinky diapers once those bad boys get used, aren't they? <laughs> what a blessing that's going to be. Thank you. And if you forgot this week, bring them. We'll deliver them. We have some ongoing contact there, okay? So no, no worries uh, if you weren't here to hear about that. Just a single mom that I became aware of could use a hug from Jesus, and that's what we want to specialize in. You know, so. uh, hopefully some of you have picked up a copy of The Good and Beautiful God by James Bryan Smith. We're going to go through that together in uh, some time to come, so go ahead and get you a copy of that um, so you'll have it available. If you need help securing that, let me know, and we'll do what we can to help you with it, okay? For now, Acts chapter 3. What a scene outside the temple. A guy who had never known strength in his legs. We'll find out next week that we get the insight that he's past 40 years old. Anybody 40 in here? Anybody want to care to admit that? No, but not just 40, man. I know you're, I wanted a visual aid at 40. You, you're not going to work. So anyway, 40, past 40 years old and uh, never walked. The, you know, I don't mean this cruelly, but from a cultural perspective, his value was in what he could muster as they would position him when the crowd would come by and hopefully somebody would have, have a heart to give him a little donation. He was positioned in an important spot as people would come to the temple to pray. Thinking, well, if they're coming to pray, they're pious people, they'll surely want to give alms to a beggar. So I justified his existence from a family perspective because he couldn't produce otherwise. And so here he was, 40 years, never having walked. And here comes Peter and John to the temple to pray. They were still practicing the rhythms that had always been a part of their life, even though the new covenant is now in place. They were coming to pray and they see this fellow. And as they catch eyes, okay, honest moment here, confession. When you see somebody who is, who is asking for assistance, how many times do you just try not to make eye contact with them? Come on, you roll up on your way out of Walmart and you just hope you don't get stuck at the light there because somebody's there with their sign, right? You says, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to... Well, Peter locks eyes with this guy and something stirs. Oh boy, I'm going to get a gift, you know. That's what he was looking for. He was looking for a donation. There was no faith in this man's heart that was going to prompt what was going to happen. It was going to be a gift from Peter and John to him in the name of Jesus. Now, I think that's significant as we put together this whole concept of the miraculous as we make our way through Acts because somebody, sometimes people will say to us that no wonder you didn't get healed, there was something wrong with your faith. I, 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 this guy had no faith whatsoever. He just wanted a handout. He just wanted a little meal money and he got healed, right? So just tuck that away into your uh, theology about gifts of healing. Now, not that our faith isn't important. There was a lot of faith here, and it was happening in the heart of Peter and John as they were going to ex extend faith in Jesus to bring healing to this man. And sure enough, he reaches out his hand in that touch, raises him up. Can, can you try to put yourself in the place of that man? These legs had never, ever worked. Those ankles had never, ever borne weight. And suddenly, here they are. How many of you can sing the song? He went walking and leaping and praising God. Walking and leaping and praising God. I gave a little thought to jumping off here, but I'd probably catch my toe. Uh, and splat. Uh, <laughs> Man, was this dude excited. You want to give it a try? You come and show me, brother. Uh, <laughs> Man, was he excited, and he didn't care who knew it. You talk about a wow moment. 
And as the crowd heard the commotion and began to gather in, it's an important thing that it says they recognized him as the one who was always positioned at the beautiful gate outside the temple. What is he doing walking? Now, my old cynical mind these days would say, ah, now wait a minute, is this a scam? What's going on here? <laughs> but they had watched this guy years and years and years because that was his place. And you know, there's something about legs that have never walked. Muscles atrophy and bones do strange things. They knew who this guy was. Who this guy used to be. <laughs> because in the name of Jesus, he wasn't who he used to be anymore. It's the wow factor. Wow. What has happened? And that text came to an end. If you were listening closely, uh, everybody, as they came, they were taking note of him as had, being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Wonder and amazement. Wow. Now, was it, was it that the disciples, the apostles here, just wanted to put on a show for entertaining folks say, Ooh, look at what we can do. Or is there much more to it than that? This unleashing of the power of God into the presence of people. Well, we got a hint, I think, back in chapter 2 when Peter preached the very first message that would launch the birth of the church. In chapter 2, verse 22, when Peter starts, he says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. God the Father was giving Jesus the credentials that he needed in light of the message that he was communicating. And those credentials were the wow of the miraculous. Even the Pharisees, remember as Nicodemus snuck in at night, he said, we know that, that, that only someone sent from God could do what you're doing. <laughs> credentials. Jesus was flashing the credentials of who he was and it was showing up through glimpses of God's glory through these miracles. That's what Jesus is doing. Now, it's been passed to the next generation. The apostles, who Paul teaches us were foundational upon the, uh, which the church was going to be built. They too are able to flash the credentials saying, you better listen up, look at this. Because the real deal is not what they were able to do. You know what, those guys' legs that for the first time were walking and leaping and running around, there was going to come a day when they weren't so energetic and eventually those legs were going to quit working because the old heart and his body, it wasn't going to last forever. The real thing was the message that they were preaching which does indeed last forever. I would contend with you that an even greater miracle had occurred already back in Acts chapter 2 when 3,000 people came to life forever. We would do an awe and granted at a miracle of a lame man who had never walked, suddenly walking and leaping and praising God. That's a wild moment indeed. But can we entertain the thought that someone living forever is way better than that. 3,000 resurrections, spiritual resurrections took place one chapter ago and we said, oh, it's a great miracle. Many of you have already experienced an eternal miracle, a miracle of an eternal significance because you are going to live forever. <coughs> you have come back to life from the dead <laughs> when you placed your faith in Jesus. Peter goes on to that pretty quickly. They, he's got their attention. The audience is there. They're listening because of what has happened in the life, in the body of this lame man. We don't even know his name. I don't know what to call this guy. But he capitalizes on that moment and just like before, he starts to take him back through what had just happened. Jesus came and, and, and did incredible things, and you guys bailed out on him. I like the part that's mentioned on Pilate's behalf. When Pilate 
had decided to release him, you wouldn't have it. And so as a result, he was crucified. But God raised him from the dead. And now there is opportunity for you. And here's what he says needs to happen in order for you to experience that miracle of, res uh, uh, that miracle of, uh, of resurrection that he has for you, new life that will last forever. You don't get that by just showing up at church services. You don't get that because you can. You, you have a grandma that believes. You get that because you've made a decision in your heart. And just like the first sermon, he comes back to that all-important word, repent. Did you hear it as it was read? Repent. There's got to be a change of mind. It's the same word he used in the previous message, only in the previous message he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. This time he says, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. As we are building a theology, as we go through this, as we're examining the messages of the, the apostolic generation, it's really important because you could just read chapter 2 and think, well, you've got to be baptized to, save. This time, to be saved. This time, Peter doesn't even mention baptism. He says, repent and return. Thank prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son decided he didn't need any relationship with dad. He was going to go make his own way. And off he went, having received his part of the inheritance. And he gets out there and he squanders his inheritance. You remember the story. And then the drought comes and he's either going to starve to death or he's going to eat what he's supposed to be feeding to the pigs. Not a real glamorous uh, ascension here, right? He is on his way down. But there in the pig pen, eating the leftovers that the pigs had left, the scripture tells us he returns to his senses. Might we say he has a change of mind? And he said, what am I doing here? I'm going to die. I'm going to go home. I'm going to return to where I belong. And he lights out for home. But he's not sure just exactly what the reception is going to be when he gets there, you know. Did you ever head for home? A little concerned about what dad was going to look like when you got there? Maybe arms crossed, maybe grouchy eyebrows. You know, one of those kind of deals. You ever get, you know? And so he starts practicing on his way home the speech he's going to deliver when he sees dad again. Father, I've sinned in the sight of heaven and in your eyes. I'm no longer to be worthy to be called your son. Just let me be one of your slaves. And he practices and practices and practices, I think. Because it's a big moment. And he's approaching home. No doubt, heart rates up. Wondering what on earth and what's going to happen when I get there. But before he arrives, oh, he discovers dad's been watching. I think dad can't wait for that boy to get home. Dad doesn't wait. For that boy to get home, he lights out and runs to him. I've read that was a very undignified thing for a father to do. A patriarch did not do something so demeaning, especially once there had been such offensive behavior. You, you remain staunch and in your place and let them grovel, hoping to be received again. And not this day. This is a different day. Dad lights out. And even before the boy can launch into his speech, dad's wrapped him up in his arms and kissed that stinking boy. Still smelling of the pig pen, I think. <laughs> Kissing him. Oh. Son catches a moment and he says, man, I've got to capitalize on it right now. Father, I've sinned in the sight of heaven and in your sight. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Repentance and return. Can you hear it there? Acknowledgement that I don't measure up, God. I don't measure up. And then the boy, remember, he was going to, he was going to take control of defining his future. I don't deserve to be your son. Just make me a slave. Papa didn't want to hear any of that business. You know what he did then? Hey, 
wrap him in the royal robe, put the ring on his finger and sandals and kill the calf. We go to party because this boy was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's been found. He has repented and he has returned. Now not everybody's so excited about that. There is that older brother he says, ah, this dude hasn't been keeping the rules. What's he doing here? Some of you heard that kind of chatter in your ear. You know? Papa doesn't want to hear any of that business either. He's thrilled that you're home. That you have repented and come home. It's made possible through the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Oh, this chapter and the next chapter and scattered throughout Acts, we're going to do lots of name dropping. You ever drop any names? <clears throat> once in a while, once in a while I'll lend my name maybe to one of my kids or, 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 or somebody that I know. I'll say, hey, look, when you get there, Tell them that I sent you. I don't, I don't have any, you know. But occasionally they'll be in a situation where that just might help. I just thought of this. She's not here, so I'll tell this story. One time, Jackie was on her hurry, a hurry to get into Charleston. She was a teenager with a hot car. And she was hurrying in, to, and, and she kind of, you know how you come to the five-mile house, and there's a stop sign there, but you, you know, Occasionally you interpret that S-T-O-P as sometimes only pause, and you don't really <laughs> stop. And you just go, whoosh -hoo. Well, there was a, a, a constable sitting there at the Five Mile House, and he pulled her over and, and come up to the window, and she hands him his, her, her license, and, and he says, uh, are you Jack Sweeney's daughter? Yeah. Okay, miss, you slow down, go on. <laughs> Old Dad's <coughs> shadow had saved the day. <laughs> Did they ever try that on you, Matt? Anybody that really tried that, try a little name dropping? Did it ever help? Did it ever help? Tyra. Yeah. <laughs> I'm hearing rarely. Is it, you know, give that up. Don't count on it, is the idea. But as far as the father's concerned, you drop the name of his son, it goes a long way. Matter of fact, it goes the only way. And the early church knew that. that. Salvation comes from that name and that name alone. And we welcome that gift through repentance and returning. And he sends Jesus on our behalf. I think we have much to learn. I think we have much to learn when it comes to name dropping the name of Jesus. Especially when it comes to experiencing his power in our lives. In the early 80s, uh, I was at a school out in Virginia and the dean of students was Ed Dobson, fiery little Irishman and uh, loved to preach the word. Man, he was funny. And I graduated and left, and I heard later that he'd gone up to Grand Rapids, Michigan to uh, pastor a big church up there. And uh, as I assumed, it was doing really well for the kingdom. And, and then I heard that he had received a rather unfortunate diagnosis of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And, uh, in, in, in the thumbnail, basically what that does is your muscles just stop working. I mean, and there are some muscles we just can't live without, like hearts and lungs and things, right? And they eventually fall prey. And so when I noticed a, 
a book that Ed Dobson had written titled Prayers and Promises When Facing a Life-Threatening Illness caught my attention because you won't find in this book religious platitudes, but they come from the honesty of a man who was going through it and, and, and courageous enough to be truthful about what he's experiencing. told the first service that uh, <clears throat> when I got into this chapter I, I, I knew I needed to tell you this story but the problem is when you read a lot you can remember that you read something of significance but can't always remember where you read it yes mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I searched high and low these days my go to is Mr. Google and he'll just about never fail me guess what didn't help and I just took a chance and, and pulled this little book off the shelf. And on day 11, the morning prayer was titled, God, help me get lost in the wonder of who you are. And Dobson says this, when I first received the diagnosis of my disease, I wanted to be anointed with oil and prayed over by those who actually believe in healing here in that James chapter 5. So I called my good friend Wayne Benson, former pastor of the First Assembly of God in Grand Rapids. I knew he believed, I knew he believed in healing, so I asked him and his wife to come over and anoint me with oil. The evening that came was one of the most powerful evenings in my entire life. Wayne and his wife spent several hours with my wife and me. They talked about healing. They told stories of people in their church who had been anointed with oil and who had been miraculously healed. They also told stories of people who were anointed with oil and who had not been miraculously healed. Before Wayne anointed me with oil, he gave me this advice. This is the part I remember and that I want to, I want you to, let's, sink deep into your soul. This pastor said to Dr. Dobson, do not become obsessed with healing. Get lost in the wonder of God. And who knows what God will do for you? Back to Dobson's words. Get lost in the wonder of God. I had been lost in the wonder of my disease. Now I was being told to get lost in the wonder of God. What I want to say to you is that the real undeniable miracle is that God would want a relationship with people like you and me. He wants one. So much did he want one that he came to this earth and allowed himself to be treated like he did. Murder on a Roman cross. But God raised him up to say, not so fast. That's not the end of the story. There is now, as a result of all this, a gift of eternal life, a gift that will never come to an end. I believe that God still can and on occasion extends to us the gift of physical healing. I believe he still delights on occasion to do that. But if you happen to receive one of those gifts, I promise you it ain't gonna last forever. <laughs> This little body is going to get tired and wear out. But if you have received the gift of eternal life through your faith in Jesus, death, burial, and resurrection, you are going to last forever. That's the real miracle. Undeniable. Have you, in the name of Jesus, <clears throat> received that gift? A miracle that never ends.
Katie Nicole has a song. Uh, I forget the title of it, brother. Remind me again. In Jesus' name, it's a prayer. My prayer for you this morning, first and most important, is that's good. That the name of Jesus has brought eternal life to you, forgiveness of sin, a reconciled relationship with God. Nothing matters more than that. Become skilled in dropping the name of Jesus in the midst of the broken world we live in. But I assure you that before we will be effective at doing so, it will require us to get lost in the wonder of God. Dallas Willard said this, God is looking for people who he can trust with his power. Great responsibility comes with representing Jesus effectively in this world today. Let's make sure we are becoming people like that. Amen? Amen. Broken world around us needs to see Jesus. Let's make sure they get a chance. God bless you all. It's been good to worship. Let's practice some one another's before you go. Let's go be the church. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.